Hey, what is up you Security Plus preppers? These are the IT Dojo Security Plus questions of the day. I am Colin Weaver. Each and every single day I ask you two questions for you to ponder and contemplate while you're doing your studies. Let's go ahead and get right to it. Okay, question number one on the board. As part of their business continuity and disaster recovery planning processes, an increasing number of companies are actively uh, recruiting and developing in-house their employees for key roles within the organization. Now, which of these terms is used to describe that program or that process? Go ahead and click pause, give us some thought. When you're ready, click play, we'll break it down. Okay, answer number one, risk management. No, not what we're looking for. Uh, risk management is all about going in and knowing what the value of your assets are, what the bad things are that can happen to those assets, and uh, how likely it is those things are gonna happen to you, and then taking steps to go ahead and reduce the likelihood of that taking place. So that's not what we're looking for right here. Option number two. COOP, C-O-O-P, Continuity of Operations. Um, nope, not specifically what we're looking for here either. Either. Item number three, succession planning. Absolutely, this is what we're looking for. As part of business continuity and disaster recovery plans, uh, succession planning is a component of those that goes in and really looks to groom and nurture and develop from within the people in your organization who are going to be able to fill key roles as the people who the currently have them either uh, retire, quit, die, whatever. Okay, so the whole idea is, is that it's easier to groom people from within um, and get them ready for the role and so that they can in, you know, naturally sort of progress into it rather than that role suddenly being empty and now you've got to go out into the, into the marketplace and try and find somebody who's A, going to have the skill set in order to do that job and B, is going to fit into the culture of your organization. Uh, they, that's not necessarily an easy thing to do and it could take time. Succession planning is one of those things that you know, appears to have wins-wins for everybody. From an employee perspective, they're getting uh, mentoring, they're getting training, they're getting uh, you know, lateral movements within the company so they can develop their skill set. Um, it, it's being demonstrated to them that the company sees value in them and that they want to see them grow within the organization. That's going to make them more likely to stay. So it's a win from that perspective. It's a win from the company's perspective because you're going to have people who are ready to do the job um, should you suddenly need to have somebody filling the, uh, a new a role that's currently filled by somebody else. You know, again, if somebody dies unexpectedly or something like that, we need to be able to kind of know who's going to be able to, to move up into those roles. Um, it's also a win if you are dealing with stockholders, because if stockholders have a warm and fuzzy feeling, particularly for the senior executive leadership of an organization, that, that the stockholders know that you basically have plans in place in order to be able to go in and replace key people if they suddenly leave, this, you know, this, the, the CSO or the CIO or the CEO or whoever of your organization, that's going to help them stay calm you know, if it suddenly comes out in the news that the, you know, the CEO died of a heart attack kind of a thing, because you have succession planning in place, they know that everything is, is basically already planned out, is already accounted for. Okay. So it's gonna make them feel better. Uh, third option on the list, emergency response planning. Again, no, not what we're looking for here. Succession planning is a better answer. And then the final list, the final item on that was a recovery time objectives or RTO. No, recovery time objectives is, is how much time can pass between when something fails versus when it has to be back up and running again. So definitely not what we're looking for right here. Succession planning is your best answer. Okay, let's put question number two up on the board. Uh, which of the following items are going to be contributing factors to how long it's going to take an attacker to crack a password hash? Click pause, give that list a read. When you're ready, click play. We'll talk it through. Okay, first item on the list, password age settings. Uh, this is a, that's not what we're looking for here. Password age settings is gonna go in and define how old passwords can be before uh, they have to be replaced. While you might wanna try and argue for this, saying that, oh, well, if the password has to be changed on a regular basis, then it's gonna make it more difficult for the attacker. But that's not what the question's asking about. The question's asking about what's gonna factor into how long it's gonna take for somebody to actually brute force or, or, or attack a hash. Um, changing the password on a regular basis doesn't factor into how long it takes them to do it. Whether or not the password is actually usable after they've cracked it, that's a different story. So even though that's a compelling answer, it's not an answer that's appropriate for this particular question. Item number two on the list is password complexity. Absolutely. Um, you know, complex passwords are less easy for people to, to crack or otherwise compromise. Um, you know, if your password is just based on a single dictionary word or an elite speak version of a word or something like that, then, then it's, it's a much easier thing to go in and attack. So making them complex is definitely something that's going to make it a bigger challenge for the attacker to go in and, and uh, figure out what the password is. 
Third item on the list is account lockout settings. Again, if you were trying to directly attack an interface, um, you know, a login interface or something like that, the account lockout setting may go in and prevent somebody from being able to log in. But the question asks about um, how long is it going to take them to go in and actually crack a hash, which means that they already have the hash. They're not necessarily going to be trying to log into an interface doing this. They're going to be off in their nerdery somewhere going in and brute forcing the dictionary attacking this hash to see if they can figure out what the password is. So um, however many logins before you lock their account in has nothing to do with how long it's going to take them to brute force it. So no, that's also not an answer that you're looking for. Next batter up is password length. Absolutely. Uh, by itself, no. You know, a long dictionary word is arguably just as easy to crack as a short dictionary word. So it's not just about passwords being long, but certainly the length combined with their complexity is going to be a contributing factor to how much work is going to have to go into the attacker figuring out what the, what the actual uh, plain text password is. Next item, uh, password algorithm used. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, because some algorithms can be cryptographically intense. Uh, an excellent example of this would be something like bcrypt, which by increasing the work factor, it's going to take an attacker an increasingly longer amount of time to go in and try different uh, possible hashes to see if they can figure out what your individual hash is. So if you were to contrast that with, say, something like, you know, NCLM, uh, which is, you know, pretty stank as far as password hashing stuff kind of goes, um, uh, that's going to be significantly easier and the number of hashes per second that can be tried is, is dramatically higher. Um, so different algorithms are going to take longer to brute force based upon the cryptographic effort involved in the actual algorithms themselves. Now, it's, it's a very complicated and, and involved topic, but that's, that's a suffice to say a, a good general answer for us to go and look at. And then the last item on the list is password history settings. You know, uh, not allowing people to reuse the same password over and over and over is definitely a smart play, but it doesn't have anything to do with this question. The question was how often or how long is it going to take or how hard is it going to be for somebody to uh, brute force a password hash or attack a password hash. The fact that they haven't been able to use the same password for the past 24 passwords or something like that has nothing to do with how long it's going to take somebody to brute force it. So even though that may have kind of uh, made you want to click that as an answer or choose that as an answer, that's not the right thing to do. So to sum it up, the best choices from this particular question are password complexity, password length, and the algorithm that are used. All right, there you have it. Two more questions down. I hope they were helpful for you. If you like them, please click like. If you want to get them every single day, please click subscribe. And that's it. I'll see you tomorrow.